All right. So um, I'm Ann Junker, the immediate past principal, and I'm going to be standing in for Paul Harrison today because he's just had a late-breaking medical appointment organized uh, for his wife. So this is uh, going to start with our annual uh, general meeting. And I did that wrong. Oh. And uh, this is a three-part program, which starts with the business meeting, goes into the award cer ceremony, and then we have our guest speaker. So we open with the territorial land acknowledgement in that the UBC campuses are located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Sila Okanagan nations and their peoples. I also want to give a special welcome to people who are online. Um, we are holding this first uh, business meeting this year as a hybrid event. And for those of you online, we haven't got the tech set up for you to ask a question in person. But if you type these into the Q&A box on Zoom, a member of the staff, uh, Sandra, will uh, ask that for you. And we also extend a special welcome to colleagues joining online uh, from the Okanagan campus. I'm going to start uh, with a moment of silence to think of friends and colleagues who are no longer with us. Thank you. We now move to approval of the agenda for this meeting. Are there any uh, comments or uh, uh, business uh, that you would like to bring forward? I ask first of the people online, and there are no questions there. Any uh, additional business people want brought forward? Hearing now uh, none, I uh, uh, recognize the agenda to be approved. And then we move to approval of the minutes of May 17th at last year's AGM. And again, I ask if there are any edits or clarifications that re are required. First, of those online. And I see no comments. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm as close as I can. But um, yes, yeah, so this was asking any comments or clarifications or edits to the minutes of last year. And again, uh, seeing none, hearing none, I consider those approved. We now move to the principal's report, which was uh, put forward by uh, Paul. And in 2024 now, the Emeritus College is six years old. We've now got 1,877 members. And these individuals, the Emeriti, represent 20% of UBC academics. And this was actually a figure that uh, President Bacon uh, really mentioned when he met with us. And he said that that's really quite a considerable number of people. We really need to recognize the Emeriti. We've had smaller numbers of new Emeriti and college members elected uh, this past year, a total of 40. Um, and uh, we've also had uh, two new individuals uh, recognized with the Order of Canada. And these are Morris Bearer from the School of Population and Public Health and uh, Sally Thorne from Nursing. We have two new uh, recipients of or the Order of BC, and these are Jane Buxton from the School of Population and Public Health and Peter Cullis from Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So it was a busy year, another busy year, and we have uh, considerable thanks to 
the folks in the office and all of the conveners and uh, organizers of our various events. We had 63 meetings, uh, and that included uh, nine uh, special interest group meetings and our business meetings. And of the nine special interest groups, there were 21 meetings from four of the programs. We've got three new special interest groups that have started up. Elizabeth Dean is convening the VEG, Vegan Enthusiast Group. We've got um, Harry Hubble uh, convening the Senior Sports Program, which takes place on the Lower Mainland. And then we have Ian Walker and Melanie Jones, who have started to organize uh, Okanagan Outdoor Activities Group, taking advantage of all of the wonderful uh, venues uh, in that setting. We've produced five reports, which include three of the Emeritus College newsletter, much thanks to Val White, who is now editor of the newsletter. We produced an annual report, which went out in September, and an information uh, booklet was organized on all of the indigenous resources available uh, to uh, college members. Uh, most recently, the last uh, general meeting involved a book display with 40 participants from the college and uh, at the general meeting which involved a poetry discussion. So there were a number of meetings and uh, I uh, want to uh, assure you that we've had tremendous support from the uh, uh, leaders um, and uh, administrators at the university. We had an excellent meeting with President Bacon sh very shortly after he arrived. There are regular meetings organized with the vice Pro provost and a special meeting w was held with the associate deans of the faculties. And uh, for those of you that have been in administration, you know that these associate deans are really the people that get things moving uh, in the various uh, areas. We've welcomed active involvement of the UBC O Emeriti, and this is uh, particularly involving um, Melanie Jones, who's just all um, enthusiastic about uh, getting the uh, UBC O and those individuals who have moved from uh, the Lower Mainland into the Okanagan to get them involved. Um, we continue to advocate for a seamless transition within IT, and sometimes this involves uh, getting IT and faculty relations and human resources to speak the same language and be on the same page. Um, uh, there's been advocating with the uh, graduate and postdoctoral studies for clearer information on I as grad supervisors, because not surprising, there is actually variability between departments and faculties as to how involved and what role Emeriti can play. We participated recently in the UBC uh, Giving Day, uh, serving to raise $22,000. We co-sponsored with Faculty Relations two uh, pre-retirement workshops for 165 faculty in total, and there were waiting lists for each of these two half-day workshops. These workshops are tremendously well received and uh, a number of people start taking them when they're just beginning to think about retirement so they get a better sense for themselves of what kind of questions and activities they should be attending to. And finally, we subsidized 28 emeriti from 22 departments, $48,500 for their scholarly and ongoing creative activities. So I'm now going to move to the results of the election of new members of the council. And I held the role as chair of the nominating committee uh, as per our terms of reference that this be held by the immediate past principal. So we have elected uh, Bill McCutcheon as principal and Sandra Bressler as vice principal uh, for this coming year. And it's uh, been an absolute pleasure for me as outgoing principal to work with Bill as he came into the vice principal this past year. And then I've had 35 years or so of working with Sandra in the uh, Children's Hospital and then uh, more recently in her activities as uh, on council and then as the uh, head of the program cluster. 
I am now going to hand over to Bill McCutcheon, who is going to take on the second half of this meeting. Thank you. So the Anne has mentioned the three retiring members from council and the three new members um, elected for a three-year term, term are Robert Armstrong and from pediatrics, David Edgington from geography, and Ruth Dirksen from civil engineering. So are they, I know that one, two of them are here. Everybody here? Anyway, let's give them a round of applause. So, any other business or questions from anybody? Well, we're going to uh, now, uh, actually, um, before I do that, yes, so uh, the outgoing people too, um, I'd forgotten their sequence in the slide here, and I thought that, um, they'd been done earlier. Anyway, uh, our Present principal, Paul Harrison, finishes his term on June the 30th. And Ann Junker, as past principal, finishes the same date. Um, I know I uh, have firsthand experience of working with both of them for the past year on the executive. And I know how much work and care they put into this, how much consideration. And I can tell you firsthand that the college is in very good hands with these people on serving us on these committees. And from the, uh, that's from the executive, from the uh, members at large, uh, or the uh, council rather, Alan Mackworth, uh, he's here today, and Paul Rogers, I don't think Paul is here, is he? Um, and Patricia Shaw, is she here? I think so. So I know that Alan is here, so I'd like to give these people, thank these people very much for their service. So we have uh, three special guests with us today who just came in and we're pleased to have them here for at least part of the meeting. There is Gage Averill. He's the Provost and Vice President Academic. And Maura Quayle, Vice President and Associate Vice President Academic. And we have Janice Stewart, the Deputy Provost and uh, this is Janice's first day. So, welcome to the three of you. Thank you for coming. Now, I'd like to call to the podium up here, um, Lynn uh, Smith uh, for the awards ceremony. So you're gonna take over. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been my honor to chair the Emeritus College Awards Committee uh, and with committee members Jim Zydek and Diana Larry for the past few years and to have served on the committee for some time. It could not possibly be a more delightful task than the one that uh, this committee has because uh, the committee members have the opportunity to see the remarkable and inspiring work uh, that our Emeritus colleagues are doing both in carrying on with scholarly and creative work and as leading community volunteers. So there are two awards, and um, the first is the Emeritus College Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors. And it is meant to recognize UBC Emeriti who have demonstrated excellence in their engagement in innovative research, artistic creation, or new applications of, of previous research since they attained emeritus status. So it's meant to recognize that many UBC emeriti don't exactly retire once they've achieved emeritus status. On the contrary, they carry on post-retirement with their research or artistic creation 
and do so with distinction. The committee considered the nominations in this category and recommended that the Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors go to Dr. Seema Godfrey, who became emeritus in 2021 in recognition of her publication of the book, Crimean War and Cultural Memory, The War France Won and Forgot, published by University of Toronto Press in 2023. And there's now a video that is going to allow you to see uh, Seema and learn more about her work. So first, I'd like to acknowledge Lynn and the other members of the awards committee for your thoughtful deliberations that brought us to this happy event today. I have the pleasure of welcoming this year's recipient of the Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors, Seema Godfrey, Associate Professor Emeritus of French, Hispanic and Italian Studies. Seema, your nominators described a body of scholarly work that is remarkable. But this award recognizes work published since retirement, and so the focus is on your recent book, a work that is indeed excellent, innovative, and creative. And that is The Crimean War and Cultural Memory, The War France Won and Forgot. Some statements from your nominators will help us understand the importance of this book. First, it is multidisciplinary in focus since it combines military, literary, and art history, to which can be added medical, and political history. As an aside, one of the great benefits of belonging to the Emeritus College is the opportunity to interact with scholars from across the disciplinary spectrum, but to find so many disciplines explored and connected in one work is extraordinary, certainly innovative and creative. Another statement of the nominator. Seema's book is a brilliant example of how academics never stop learning about the past while constantly producing new knowledge in the service of the future. What high praise for an academic. Further, the book is like a Sherlock Holmes mystery for it is built around an enigma, the concomitants of memory and forgetting. To explain why France celebrated and then promptly forgot the only war that it won in the 19th century. I admit as someone of British ancestry and familiar with Ford's Nightingale, the Victoria Cross and Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, to learn that a nation involved in the war has more or less forgotten it is surprising. But I'm not going to reveal the denouement, that delight awaits the reader. And a final quote, Seema. This is an important book, beautifully illustrated, based on meticulous research. It reads well, is never boring or tedious. This is indeed a scholarly endeavor worthy of praise and of this reward, and I'm honored to be able to present it to you. Well, I'm honored and humbled to receive it. Uh, this came as a, a total surprise out of the blue to me, and I am so touched to know of the support and confidence my colleagues have in me. It, it really means a lot. Right. And did you want to know the origin of this book? Because it is sort I, I of- think, I think our friends here in the audience might be interested in a little bit more of the background. Okay, um, I, I call this sort of the intellectual power of, hmm, um, what? And this has to do with the fact I've spent most of my career working on French literature and art and even uh, the fashion industry in the 1850s. And at one point, somebody mentioned to me a French participation in the Crimean War. And I checked the dates and it's 1854 to 1856. And I said, I read everything that was written and published in the 1850s. How is it that I don't know anything about this war? And so after a certain amount of self-shaming, I took a, another breath and I said, wait a second, how is it that I don't know anything since I read everything written there? And that's when I stumbled on this fact that it wasn't written about. And so then I decided, well, I have to figure out what's going on here. And that's where the Sherlock Holmes mystery uh, comes into it. And it was a true revelation. I had never done military history, medical history of any of, the, of these things, but they are very, very pertinent in uh, this examination. So it was it was wonderful to discover all these different approaches and discourses and issues. Isn't it wonderful how you know, in a career you, there can still be surprises that, that can delight you and lead to a new area of investigation? That's wonderful. It is Thank wonderful. you very much and congratulations again. Thank you so much.
did you want to see the certificate? Yes. Lovely. <laughs> there it is. Thank you. Suitable thank for framing. You. Sorry? <laughs> Suitable for framing. Right, right up with my high school diploma. And uh, thank you to the Emeritus College for your support. I really, really appreciate it. Well done. Well deserved. Thank you, Seema. Thank you. Unfortunately, Seema couldn't be with us today, but please join me in celebrating her remarkable achievement. <laughs> Could not be a more paradigmatic example of what the award is meant for, in my opinion. Um, the second award is the President's Award. Oh, sorry. The second award is the President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti. And its description is, it's meant to go to UBC Emeriti who have, since attaining UBC Emeritus status, displayed exceptional leadership in volunteer community services. And this award is from the UBC's president upon the recommendation of the Emeritus College Awards Committee. Um, it is meant to um, single out leading and exceptional emeriti for their work as volunteers in the committee, in the community. And the, commu the um, Emeritus Awards Committee considered the nominations in this category and recommended that the award for distinguished service go to Dr. Robert Armstrong for his work um, since he became an emeritus professor in 2011 in establishing a medical college at the Aga Khan University in Kenya and improving access to a specialized health care in East Africa. And you're now going to be treated to a video um, featuring... Hello, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to present the President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti to Dr. Robert Armstrong. This prestigious award recognizes UBC Emeriti who've demonstrated exceptional effort or leadership and volunteer community contribution since attaining UBC's Emeriti status to the benefit of society in Canada or internationally. We celebrate and honor emeriti who've consistently demonstrated outstanding achievements beyond their scholarly work. Dr. Armstrong was selected for his dedication not only to the University of British Columbia, but for his unwavering commitment to improving healthcare delivery and research in East Africa. He worked to establish an Aga Khan University Emeritus College modeled after the UBC Emeritus College which now brings together emeritus faculty from all of the AKU campuses, including Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the United Kingdom. Dr. Armstrong began his UBC career as a pediatrician with a clinical appointment at Sunny Hill Health Center, which is part of BC Children's Hospital. In his first decade after retirement, Dr. Armstrong served as Dean of the Aga Khan University Medical College in Nairobi, Kenya, where he played a pivotal role in enhancing healthcare delivery and research in rural East Africa, focusing on underserved regions. Under his leadership, the medical college saw phenomenal growth with the faculty growing from 35 to more than 130 members, fostering a new generation of medical specialists. Dr. Armstrong helped foster interdisciplinary collaboration between the medical college and the School of Nursing and Midwifery. He transitioned the institution to a high quality teaching hospital with international accreditation and introduced cutting edge interdisciplinary research programs in women's and children's health, oncology, cardiac sciences, mental health, and neuroscience. He also helped establish a medical college campus in Tanzania, which enhanced residency programs and research capabilities. Notably, the residency program that he started with only seven residents grew to include 223 residents under his leadership. He also implemented new postgraduate programs in areas of specialization such as family medicine that were rare or non-existent in the region before his tenure. Dr. Armstrong's efforts culminated in the planning and construction of a new academic health science center equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to support an advanced curriculum in health sciences and his work did not stop at education. He was also instrumental in developing clinical services for child disability in Karachi 
and spearheading innovative public health studies. After returning to Vancouver, Dr. Armstrong continues his dedication to medical education and healthcare improvement. He's currently documenting the history of the Department of Pediatrics at UBC and engaging many members of the department in this significant project. Dr. Armstrong, for your unwavering commitment to improving healthcare, education, and your continued impact on the global community, I'm so proud to present you with the 2024 President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeritus. Congratulations. Thank you. My great pleasure. Thank you, President Bacan. We, uh, as the Emeritus faculty, we really appreciate the recognition of your office and you personally uh, for these awards. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Congratulations again. Um, may I invite you to the podium, Dr. Armstrong? And you can receive a second copy of the certificate. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to say that I, I did not write that story. <laughs> And I think uh, President Dakan was a little um, overwhelmed by having to, to read it all. <laughs> um, I, I'm equally surprised and honored to, to be recognized by the college, and I, I really thank you. Um, clearly, what you heard in the, in the story was much more about we than me. Um, obviously, none of that happens uh, through an individual, and I had a small role in developing uh, medical education uh, within the Aga Khan organization. And um, I, I have um, stolen or borrowed from the college the idea of the college. And um, we have established for the first time a, a emeritus college uh, that will, that sits in, in England and uh, in Pakistan and East Africa. Uh, it has a very small membership. But many of those emeritus members were just celebrating, AKU is just celebrating their 40th anniversary as a university. And so many of the current emeritus uh, members of the university are, are alive and actually greatly appreciate this, this concept of emeritus professors. So once again, uh, thank you to the committee and uh, to the college as a whole. And I think the most valuable um, lesson is that the, the university as a whole in this case, UBC recognizes the importance of Emeritus College uh, members in, in the academy of the university. And I think we will spread that uh, more, more widely in the globe. So thank you very much. So just uh, one more thing. Um, this is my final year on the uh, awards committee. Jim Zydek is going to be the incoming chair. And uh, Patricia uh, Armstrong, Patricia Shaw, excuse me, has agreed to join the committee. But I want you all, please, to think about um, colleagues that you would like to nominate. Um, you've seen um, how inspiring it is to look into the work that uh, some of our colleagues are doing uh, in their so-called retirement, and it's a, a wonderful way for the um, um, contribution that emeritus colleagues can make to be recognized. So please think about nominations. And there will be information coming out from the college in due course about how to make those nominations. Thank you very much. Well, we're very um, pleased and privileged today to have in our presence uh, Dr. Jeremy Heil from UBC Physics and Astronomy to tell us about the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, Jeremy came here in 2003, and just this past January, he um, was appointed head of the department. Jeremy has worked at and associated with many previous universities. He got his PhD in the States at Santa Cruz and he's uh, studied at Princeton, Durham, Cambridge, and uh, as well as Santa Cruz and worked at Caltech and Harvard. 
he joined uh, UBC faculty in 2003. So, um, Jeremy is, uh, is becoming quite familiar. He's not just talking about the James Webb Space Telescope from uh, things he's read and heard about. He's actually quite familiar with it. Um, you know, when an instrument like this comes online, uh, and like this, I mean, so powerful and, of course, so expensive, it um, means that there have been many, many years of previous years of lobbying the politicians to please put this telescope on your, high on your list and please fund it. Well, the uh, one way to judge this, so really whether it's a suitable, tele suitable instrument and whether they made good judgment, is to look at the, um, the um, waiting list for applicants to get on, the uh, subscription list. And most telescopes, that they're really this powerful and this important, have subscription lists that are um, very, very high. They, in other words, uh, the waiting times are very, very high for people to get on, and a very small fraction of people who do apply for time get on. Jeremy and his research team have applied twice for time on the telescope, and they've been successful each time. So he does know something about the telescope. So, Jeremy, welcome. Thank you for giving your time to this, and uh, we appreciate having you here. Thank you, Bill. So, that was, so I kind of chuckled. We applied for time many, many times. <laughs> uh, we, we applied, the project that I'm going to talk about was something that we conceived of around 2017, and there was a opportunity to apply for time uh, called early release time, meaning that you're first on the telescope, more or less. Um, we didn't get that. Then we, in the first year of observations, we applied, we might have had three, maybe four or five different proposals, different sorts of science. Got one out of five, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I think in the second cycle, didn't we applied and weren't successful. And in the third cycle, uh, we were successful. But our, our oversubscription rate, personally, in our group, is about five to one. Meaning, you know, we throw the spaghetti at the wall five times, and only once does it stick, but, uh, but then we try again. So uh, the program that I'll preview uh, towards the end uh, is one that was, uh, we didn't get time in a previous cycle, and we went back, improved the proposal, improved the science, and uh, we, we got it. Uh, so it's not like a, I'm even batting 500, folks, <laughs> but... It doesn't matter. This is wonderful. Even if I get one fifth of 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 what I'm trying for, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, sort of the efforts that JWST, our group here, uh, my my group. There's other people at uh, UBC who also are participating with JWST, in particular, Allison Mann. But I'm going to focus on uh, what we were doing, and uh, of course, uh, Harvey Richer uh, played a huge role in this, and he would have been among you, but he passed away in, uh, in November. Uh, you knew Harvey? Yeah. So it's a bit bittersweet, but uh, 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 well, we, we move on. Uh, we keep doing the work that he was thinking about. So. I'm first going to talk a little bit about what JWST is, uh, maybe why it's called JWST, which was a little bit of a, there was a little bit of a controversy there, uh, and why it sort of looks quite a bit different than you think a telescope would look when we look at it, and I'll show you why. Uh, and we'll, I'll explain why that is and, and why it ended up being so expensive, but also, uh, well, I would say it's worth it, right? We, you know, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the different instruments, like, and what their roles are. Uh, but our program is just focused on one of those 
instruments, which is to take big, pretty pictures. So we'll also see what the raw data looks like from JWST, uh, and I'll explain a little bit of how, how things didn't go completely straightforwardly, and then I'll talk about uh, our future program, and then just some highlights of things to expect uh, JWST to be able to do. So what is JWST? So we've seen this, or maybe you've seen this picture, uh, this artist rendition of, uh, of the telescope. It's from a, an angle where it's kind of, I'm wondering if I can hold this. It's just weird for me to, then I can walk around a little bit. Uh, great. So it, it doesn't really look like, like you imagine a telescope, like where is the telescope here? You know, shouldn't a telescope look like this or like this? Uh, so th there, there's a reason why it's built like this, uh, and I'll kind of go through that in a little bit. And uh, let's see, they said I could advance. Oh, there it is. So uh, in December 2021, uh, astronomers got this lovely Christmas present, which was the launch of JWST. It, it turns out, I think the original launch date for JWST might have been 10 years earlier than this, or it, it's been in the making for uh, a very long time. Uh, it was launched in 2021 from uh, uh, French Guiana. Uh, on an Ariane 5, which is this large rocket. And this is the last picture we had of JWST as it's floating off, uh, off the rocket. And if we look, this, this ring here at the bottom is this ring at the bottom here. So if you look at that picture, you know, that doesn't look like you would imagine this thing looks like from the bottom. So something had to happen in between uh, because uh, you know it, it sort of builds itself in orbit. So the James Webb Telescope was conceived of as the next thing, the next big project after the Hubble Space Telescope in the range of energies for light around where we can see. The Hubble Space Telescope goes from the ultraviolet a little bit into the infrared. JWST starts at what we would perceive as red and goes very far into the infrared. And the astronomers at the time, well, they came up with some ideas and they were thinking of a telescope that maybe the mirror is half the size of this mirror that James Webb. But the uh, NASA administrator at the time, Dan Golden, was saying, well, we can do this. The, this we, we really want to have a moonshot. But he also believed it could be done not very expensively. So the initial price tag was something like a few billion dollars. But it's ended up being uh, around $10 billion, a little bit more. Uh, but in fact, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, all in, with all of the servicing missions also cost about that much. So it, it isn't, uh, it's expensive, but it's not crazy expensive. Uh, so uh, Golden wanted them to be ambitious, which also drove up the price tag. And we have this, this huge structure here, and we can look at some pictures to give you an idea of uh, we'll, we'll go, how big that is in a moment. So this is how it looked as it's leaving that huge rocket uh, and going into an orbit that will take it out uh, to what's called uh, the second Lagrange point. So the second Lagrange point is uh, about a million kilometers further from the sun than Earth, and it's a place where the gravity from the sun and the earth kind of balance in such a way that an object out there will orbit the sun in one year, just like the earth. So relative uh, to the earth, it's always sun, earth, and James Webb 
more or less in a line, and it's well beyond uh, uh, where the moon is. And you know, on, on its way, it basically had to unfold itself and build into this, uh, this huge telescope out there at L2. Now, why would we want to put a telescope out there? Well, there's no day and night, right? It's just sitting out there in space. So it can look at the same part of space, the sky, for a very long time. It's also not day and night. So that also means it doesn't have to go through every time it orbits the Earth, an object like Hubble will be in the shadow of the Earth, and then uh, 30 minutes later in bright sunlight. And that creates uh, thermal pressure on, on just the structure. So it also cr creates some challenges, and that's why it looks like this, is half of the telescope is always in the sun and half of it by design is always not in the sun. So you have to keep it cool one side while the sunlight is hitting the other side. And uh, I'll go into a little bit of how that pushes the design to look like this. So just a little picture of, you know, to get a sense of where, uh, wh what's special about this place, this place we call L2, the second Lagrange point, is you can just imagine the force of gravity is being like falling down a hill. Uh, so there's a pit near Earth, right, that you can fall towards, and of course you could fall towards the sun. And this place L2 on this landscape is sort of a saddle point. It's like a coal or a pass in the sort of mountains and valleys of gravity in the solar system. So it's a place where, without too much effort, the satellite can sit there uh, long term, and it's a very stable thermal environment. It's not that you have day and night and so on. Uh, so this is showing that, that sun shield, that large structure uh, that you saw at the bottom of JWST. And I like this picture uh, because it gives you a sense of how big it is. Uh, it would be difficult to fit in this room. I mean, I think it could fit lengthwise, but I don't think it could fit this way. So this was launched into space, all packaged in, I mean, it's bigger than this table, but something of the, the radius of between here and maybe that table is the fairing of that big rocket. So it gets launched into space, folded up, and it unfolds itself uh, lengthwise and then it actually snaps into place to separate each of these. Uh, basically, they're like mirrors for the heat. So the sunlight will hit the bottom of this, and very little of that energy will flow through all of these layers to reach the shadowed side of the telescope. So it's, it, it's quite crucial that this works. And also the bottom of the telescope where it's hot, you can put that's on the sunny side. You can put the solar panels, you can put your radio to the Earth, and so on, whereas all the observations are happening on, on the opposite side. So this just shows how it built itself. So it started out as something that maybe you would think looks like a telescope. It's like a long tube, but that's not... It, it had a surprise. So basically, the first thing that happened is it unfolded uh, essentially like this, this, the ribs of the umbrella that hold out this parasol. And then the parasol basically expands along those ribs in that, uh, in the third picture. And then they finally, they are, they separate, uh, and that separation increases the thermal isolation of where the telescope is. And then finally, you can see at the same time, the mirror is really big. It's about six and a half meters across, uh, which I'm not very good at that. Uh, but these tables are about two meters across. So we would have to line up three, you know, or something like six of these or seven of these tables to make the size of the mirror. And that's uh, 
that, and of course, it couldn't, we couldn't make the mirror all in one piece, but even if we could, it couldn't fit in the rocket. So the mirror also has to unfold itself, and all of this had to work, uh, you know, perfectly, or at least almost perfectly, and in fact, it worked better than uh, it needed to. So the actual images from the telescope are, are uh, even better than one would have hoped. So just to give a sense of how much bigger it is than Hubble, there's the Hubble mirror and a person there. It's about two and a half meters across, Hubble 2.4. So just a little bit bigger than one of your tables. And you can see JWST is much larger and it can pro comprised of little hexagonal segments. Uh, and, uh, you know, the ones on the, I have to think about it. Yeah, so the ones on the inside are all identical to each other and the ones on the outside are also identical to each other, but they're different. Uh, so it's a kind of complicated optical uh, to build it. And then also, of course, it folds up. <laughs> So, uh, and here it is now with the people. Now you'll ask, well, why is it, you know, it's yellow. Doesn't that make all the stars look yellow? Well, the, the, the telescope is not optimized for what we see, uh, the wavelengths of light of our eye. So like yellow is about uh, uh, a half a millionth of a meter wavelength this is what we call yellow. And uh, so half a micron, half a micrometer, whereas uh, James Webb really starts working at uh, 0.7 micrometers, which is, we can barely see it. It's, it's reddish. And then it continues from there out to about 40 micrometers. So this gold coating enhances the reflectivity of the surface. Um, in the infrared and the surface underneath is it has to be light because we're launching it up into space it's actually beryllium which is very nasty to work with it's poisonous uh, but it's used very uh, heavily which is excusing the pun because it's used because it's so light it's used in uh, in the aerospace industry but where you know you don't really care if it's poisonous. So it's used in nuclear missiles and stuff like that. And no one's really worried about the beryllium being spread out in the end, right? So, uh, so it, it was used for this, which is, it's difficult to machine, right? And, uh, but a uh, huge mirror, okay? And this gives you a sense of uh, a bit of how it unfolds or how it will unfold. This tube down the middle, there's no light there, uh, is actually where the, um, where the light flows down to the instruments, that black uh, sort of tube sticking out. So why does it look like that when you imagine a telescope to be in a tube? If you remember, uh, we're sending this telescope out into uh, effectively where it's always sunny on one side. So if we think about a, a telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, it has a closed tube and basically the heat can get caught in that tube. Now the Hubble Space Telescope, in fact, half the time it's night, half the time it's day. So it can dissipate the heat during the night time when the Earth is in between it and the sun. And, uh, and the thermal management isn't such an issue. But if we look at other telescopes that are designed like these tubes, like the Chandra Space Telescope, which is an X-ray telescope, which has a very elliptical orbit. So it spends, whoops, it spends a lot of time in the sun. Uh, and unfortunately, this dissipation of heat uh, becomes an issue, of course, when it's, I mean, the, the, these two telescopes, Hubble and Chandra, are, are 30 and uh, 40 years old, but there's, they're starting to show their age, especially with the dissipation of heat. So with James Webb from the start, it was realized that it was important that the telescope be open to space so the mirrors could cool off more effectively. And in fact, uh, and you might say if it's open to space, 
uh, won't the mirrors get hit by little things? And of course they did and they do, and that's to be expected. So in, in the closed design, you know, if you had a little meteorite, it would have to come straight in there. Whereas in an open design, it could come from any direction. And in fact, uh, the telescope's mirrors have been already hit with little things. It's not, it's not perfect anymore, but that's okay. So just to give you an idea of the, the hot side and the cold side of the telescope, and you might be like, well, on Earth, uh, if, if you were in a place that were always sunny on Earth, like there was no night, and the sun were directly overhead, it would get pretty hot. And that's what James Webb is feeling. So the sunny side of James Webb uh, is around 85 Celsius. So, uh, you know, too hot to be comfortable for us. And the cold side, I mean, everyone thinks space is really cold. And I suppose it is if you're not in the sun. But if you're in the sun, like the astronauts, a lot of their suit is set up to dissipate heat rather than to keep them warm. So with James Webb, it's designed in the same way. So this, uh, the side that's facing the sun, it, of course, is where you put the solar panels. And it's very shiny. So uh, a lot of that energy that hits that side of the telescope is just reflected back. And then there's many, many layers of reflection that are all trying to keep the heat from the other side of the telescope, which in fact is minus 233 degrees Celsius or about uh, 40 degrees above absolute zero. So very, very cold. So it's cold like space is cold or like how you imagine space is cold. And that's crucial because the instruments of James Webb basically detect infrared radiation, which is generated by things that are hundreds of degrees Kelvin or maybe a little bit warmer. So if these surfaces on the cold side of the telescope got to be that warm, you would just be inundated by that. Now, and, and that's part of why James Webb is launched out into space is because on our Earth, if we attempt to look up at these wavelengths, we're looking through the atmosphere, which is also quite hot. It's also pretty transparent, but it's, it, when we look, we see the atmosphere glowing, and then we see the cosmic sources behind it. With James Webb, uh, we simply avoid that background that we see, or better said, foreground of our atmosphere. Okay. So just to go over quickly like what all these instruments look like that do all this wonderful science, the, the telescope, of course, will uh, direct the light from the the uh, from whatever source down into here, and be, there's a focal plane back there, and in different parts of that, and we could imagine it's something like the size of the table or something a little bit smaller. Uh, you put little openings to bring the light to different instruments. So I, I was just going to go through them. You could give a sense of how big they are. Each one of these. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars to put together. Uh, so this is the one I'm gonna we're gonna talk about uh, with our observations. It's called Near Cam. It it just stands for Near Infrared Camera. So not we're all very imaginative. We like the things that can be pronounced, and you can see the size of it is sort of like the size of the table here. Uh, this one, there's no, oh, well, I guess these are like TVs, but you don't know how big it is. This is the uh, MIRI for mid-infrared instrument. So do you know what it does? It looks, near cam looks from just past where we can see or around where we see red to a wavelength maybe six or seven times longer. And then Miri takes off from there and goes to another wavelength about five or six times longer. And I'll show a graph with that in a little bit. So this instrument, it's a combination one. And the reason I bring it up is this was built 
here in Canada. So this is the Canadian contribution to the James Webb Telescope. Canada bought in when the price tag was low. So they paid about 5% of the low price to get 5% of the final telescope. So that was, that was a good deal that we got. So, um, so it was sort of half price, right? So Canada put in about a quarter of a billion dollars uh, to get 5% of a $10 billion instrument. So I think if we do the math right, we got, you got it for half price, Canada. Congratulations. So this instrument is, uh, is important because FGS stands for Fine Guidance Sensor, which means that when James Webb is pointing somewhere, this instrument is making sure that it knows where it's pointing and keeps pointing in that direction. Okay, so Canada literally has hands on the steering wheel of this telescope. Uh, and then the other instrument is called NIRIS, uh, which stands for, well, anyone guess what NIR stands for? Near infrared, excellent. And then I is, uh, well, it has two S's. I don't know why it has two S's, but I is imaging and S is spectrometer. And I don't know what the other S is, maybe to just make it pronounceable nicer, but it's a near-infrared imaging spectrometer. And then finally, there's this instrument called NIRSPEC. Yes, the near-infrared spectrometer. Uh, and what's neat about that is uh, it has these little, uh, it covers the field of the sky with this little thing where you can just open up on little parts of the sky and be able to measure hundreds of galaxies or stars all at once instead of just like, oh, I pointed the telescope at that one. So it's kind of a neat, uh, a, a neat uh, solution to this problem. Okay, so this is just showing uh, images from Hubble on the bottom. Uh, simulated images versus James Webb. So it's bringing out a few different things, right? Uh, first of all, the angular resolution of James Webb, meaning how finely it can look around the sky, is much, uh, much better. It has better eyesight than Hubble. And that's because its mirror is, is much uh, larger than Hubble's. Uh, the second thing is, is you actually are getting a lot more light with James Webb in the top image. So, you know, uh, down at the bottom, uh, you know, we can see sort of the, the galaxy and a galaxy with a bright spot in the middle. And but it just looks like a brighter galaxy, whereas on the top, we can see both the galaxy and the, the bright thing in the middle and resolve them separately. But I, it maybe makes more sense to think about it like in terms of numbers and what these numbers mean uh, is basically like how faint is the stuff that we can see with James Webb, which is the, the, the uh, red uh, versus other things that we have, whether they're on the ground or in space. So if we look at James Webb and Hubble, uh, which is way down here, so being down at the bottom means you can see really faint stuff. And then every jump like this is a factor of 10 brighter and so on. So you can see that Hubble and James Webb are sort of complementary to each other. So Hubble goes down to the infrared, but where James Webb is excellent here, Hubble is very poor. So James Webb uh, in the near infrared is a hundred times more sensitive than Hubble. And then finally, Hubble can't really do much beyond about, uh, about two microns or one and a half micrometers. So the experiments I'm gonna talk about or the observations that I'm gonna talk about are basically between uh, one and three microns and between three and five microns. So stuff that Hubble really isn't very good at. And then if we go to longer wavelengths, you can see that there's a bit of a jump. 
and this is this is just a different instrument with web uh, one is the near cam and the other is the miri so we heard about the mid infrared uh, instrument which goes now all the way from um, well, out to about 30 microns or so. So James Webb basically looks at a fa from 0.6 micron to 30. So that's a factor of 50 in wavelengths. So it's really broad. If you think about what your eye is sensible to, 0.4 micron to 0.7-ish less than a factor of two, whereas James Webb is looking at a factor of 50, and Hubble basically looks at a factor of 10 in photon wavelength, from a little bit over a tenth of a micron to a little bit more than one micron. So James Webb is, uh, is covering a much broader range than Hubble, but also different sorts of light than Hubble. And, uh, and it was designed uh, to look at the earliest galaxies. That's what pushed the design for the infrared. So early galaxies, we imagine they're making lots of stars. And stars, young stars, actually emit mainly in the ultraviolet. So like, why would you build a telescope in the infrared if we're looking for ultraviolet objects? The key is, is when these stars are being born, the universe was much smaller than it is today, and as that light propagates from then to now, it gets stretched out as the universe grows. So the ultraviolet light that these early stars were making ends up in the infrared because the universe has grown 10 times bigger. So we go from a fifth of a micrometer to two micrometers right here in the very most sensitive part of James Webb. And the other thing that happens out in space, especially where lots of young stars are forming, is the light from the stars runs into other material that heats it up and makes it emit in the infrared again. And that's why we have this sensitivity going way out here as well. So the other things up there are instruments mainly uh, on the ground. Uh, well, no, a mixture. So Gemini is a telescope on the ground. And you can see uh, if we're doing ground-based infrared work, uh, look at the kind of, or, or even Sophia is infrared in an airplane. Uh, James Webb is doing uh, 10,000 times better. So just look, so that's, you know, this blue dots up here versus way down here. So it's absolutely huge, right? When you get 10,000 times the sensitivity versus anything you've seen before, I mean, what are you going to find? Nobody knows, right? One of the things they found was just looking at the Orion Nebula, they noticed it's chucking out like pairs of Jupiters orbiting each other. Like, why? Nobody knows, but there it is. And we would have never found it with that sensitivity. So there's lots of unexpected stuff that we have to expect is going to happen. So that's really wonderful. So this is just showing uh, some pictures uh, from, from the web, uh, early images of just uh, a field of galaxies uh, in, behind a galaxy cluster. So on the left is the mid-infrared image, and on the right is the near-infrared image. And can anyone find any stars in that image? Well, the stars look like stars. They aren't like put it, that's not art. That's what they look like to James Webb. Those, that little six, uh, six-sided spike, right? So it's very easy to pick out stars in these images because they look like your know, kid might have drawn them in. But that is just a result of the design of the telescope. Uh, whereas for a galaxies, uh, they just you basically resolve the galaxies out. And if we look on the, on the right, that's just a sort of montage of a bunch of nearby galaxies in the infrared 
that are all spiral galaxies and they're looking at the center and well, you could just stare at that. That looks amazing. So, uh, so just to look, the reason why I'm going to talk about these spikes is because I'm not using James Webb to look at galaxy. I'm using James Webb to look at stars. So we get lots of these spikes and it's just kind of fun to understand them. And basically it has to do, it's a six sided shape because if you remember Hubble at a basic level was made of those little hexagons. So when you take the sort of Fourier transform of those hexagons or you think about what patterns they make, it's a six sided pattern. With Hubble, you would get things that look like stars, but they would be four spikes, not six, because of how Hubble was designed, uh, had, a, had a different sort of design. So if you're an expert now, so you can look at an image and you go, oh, that's Hubble, that's James Webb, you just, and everyone will be like, it's a party trick, but it's just count the spikes and there you go. So now it's getting into like a bit of what we were doing uh, in our program that we kind of thought up uh, around 2017, when I think the projection was it would be launched in 2019 or something. Uh, of course it wasn't, it was another few years and a whole lot happened in the world during that time between 2017 and 2019. Uh, so our, our Cycle One program started with a sort of a simple uh, idea and uh, what we wanted to look for is sort of evidence of objects like planets in a really old population of stars. So sort of asking the question, could there have been planets in the universe 10 billion years ago? Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're not looking at the unit, we're not looking back in time, because of course James Webb can do that by looking at distant objects. Astronomers aren't interested in looking at distant objects because they're far away. It's not like we're exploring Australia or something. We're interested in distant objects because the, that distance causes the light to take a lot of time to get to us. So we can actually see with James Webb what the universe looked like 10 billion years ago, right? But that's not what we're doing here. We're looking at a population of stars more like archeology span rather than a time machine. James Webb does the time machine thing as well. We're looking at the old stars and we're digging out among them for evidence of planets. So this is just a picture with James Webb of, of Uranus and Neptune. Uh, you can see their rings quite clearly. Uh, they, they, I guess whenever you do a picture of Uranus, you put it sideways to remind you, oh, it's spinning in the sideways direction relative to its orbit. but. You know, that's artistic license. Uh, this is Saturn with James Webb. Uh, pretty amazing. And then Jupiter uh, with the same instrument that we're talking about with NearCam. And it just gives you a, a sense of the, the level of the resolution of the telescope. And I bring up this Jupiter photo um, because what was neat about this was there was, of course, the announcement, maybe people saw it who are interested, where the president was pre presenting the different new images, like the first images of James Webb. But it turns out that there was a report that was issued maybe a month or so earlier that was a very technical report about how is it performing. And I think as an Easter egg, they put in pictures of Jupiter. For those of you who like skimmed through to the end of the report, that was like the bonus for you like actually gone through everything. Uh, so uh, Jupiter is pretty amazing. So what we were looking for is twofold. We were think looking at a cluster of stars called 47 Takane. So 47 is just some number in a catalog. And Takane means the constellation of the Toucan. So in the Southern Hemisphere, they have some interesting names. But even up north, there's things like the Triangle, right? But it's, this is the Toucan. This object, it, it's about the size on the sky of the full moon. And you can easily see it with your naked eye as a fuzzy object if you are down under. So 
But 47 Takane is a cluster of about 2 million or so stars. And this is a Hubble image. Uh, you, 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 they're all stars. If you look at the brightest stars there, uh, if you looked carefully, you would see that they have like not four spikes, but a few more because this is a montage of a few images. So all these stars were born f about 10 billion years ago. So our idea was something kind of, uh, well, it was novel at the time. Um, and, uh, and it's been done for several clusters now so far. So we had looked at this uh, cluster, Harvey, uh, mainly had been looking at this cluster for much of his career. And we had obtained very sensitive images from Hubble of the stars in the cluster. And basically what this shows on the right is from right to left, uh, or from left to right, on the left are blue stars, and on the right are the red stars, and on the top are the bright stars, and on the bottom are the incredibly faint stars. And the, these images uh, that produced these data on the right are some of the most sensitive images ever taken uh, with Hubble. So what, what we can see in this picture on the, on the right to start with is in blue are all the stars that we know of that are in this cluster of stars. And you can see in black there's this other structure there. And that's because this cluster is in front of the small Magellanic Cloud. So we see stars in that other galaxy there as well. Now, if we look at the picture, you can see that the stars in the cluster are kind of, they're, they're in two groups. One is over here on the left, which are blue stars that aren't very bright. And those are called white dwarf stars. They're embers of stars that have died. Okay, we're going to talk about them. And if we look over here, these are stars that are turning hydrogen into helium, sort of like our sun does. Our sun would be a star up near the top of this picture. Um, so these ones down here are very, 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 uh, they're, they're very low mass. They're very dim. And you can see at some point, there aren't really any more stars down here. And what's happening is there, there's stars, for you to be a star, you have to be at least a certain mass, around 8% of the mass of the sun. And if you're less than that, as you are being born, you, you collapse gradually and you heat up in the, in the middle, but it never gets hot enough to get the nuclear fusion going. So you basically just cool down forever. So what we were gonna do, what we were trying to do, and that's what this picture shows here, is how bright the star is uh, on the vertical and how old they are on the horizontal. And these different lines are different masses of stars. So the top line is a star, an object that actually got to become a star. So its brightness reaches a constant, and it will stay turning hydrogen to helium at that level for a trillion years or more. And ones that are just a tiny bit less massive just never have the oomph to get started. They don't ignite, and they basically cool forever. So what we were, gonna tr we were trying to do is these objects, these failed stars, are objects like Jupiter, but a bit more massive, maybe 10, 20 times more massive. And they would be cool, meaning about 1,000 degrees or a little more. And they're just cooling down from the heat of their birth. They never started nuclear fusion. But if we can measure how cool they are, well, we first know that they're there which is, uh, tells us that there's objects like planets in the cluster, and also it tells us how old the cluster is. So that's the story of looking for objects over here, very red objects. Now, the objects on the other side, they're blue and they're hot. They're blue and they're hot, so their radiation is not very much in the infrared. So why would we look at them with James Webb? 
But I told you a story how blue hot stars, if they're surrounded by debris, that debris will get heated up and it will glow in the infrared. So this is uh, one of those little blue stars on this side. And it has debris around it. So what we're looking for is stars that look very blue, according to Hubble. So they're the dead embers of a star like the sun. Yet in uh, James Webb, they're brighter than they should be. Now, why would they have debris around them like this? Well, it's not a good reason. So what happens, and we see this in white dwarf stars near us, is that oftentimes you'll see extra radiation in the infrared. And what that is thought to come from is that that star, when it was a regular star, had some planets around it. And their orbits, when the star died, got disrupted, they started running into each other and turned the whole planets into a pile of rubble that basically is orbiting the star, gets heated up by the radiation of the star, re-radiates in the infrared, and occasionally this material will fall on the star. So we can actually measure the composition, or what we think of as the composition of the interiors of planets around stars that died hundreds of millions of years ago. So that's pretty amazing, right? So we don't even necessarily have that direct information in our solar system because our planets haven't been shredded apart yet. But for these other ones, uh, we can. So what we were trying to do was we were going to look at, so this is just a simulated image with Webb where I put one of these white dwarfs here, and that's in the middle, and then we, and you can sort of tell with your eye even that if I add 30% more light, um, that it's noticeably brighter with Webb. That's 30% more light than 60% more or less, 100%, and so on. It's getting brighter and brighter. And that we could measure this effectively even when we were near another star. So that was the second goal of what we were doing. So just to show you what uh, the images coming down from Webb for this project look like uh, raw, they're not like what you see you know, in the press releases, right? So we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. So these are all stars, right? There's a few galaxies in this image, but we've been purposely looking uh, at a field of stars. So you can see that there are these spikes, and the spikes aren't even, they're more complicated, well, than you would want them to be. So there are six spikes around a bright star, but also a whole lot of other stuff, like each of the spikes is split in three, and there's lots of stuff around here as well. And in fact, you can see, do you see this little ghost up here? That's just a picture, so some light through the instrument got reflected off something else, and it hits the instrument, but it's out of focus. So what you're actually seeing here is an image of that mirror, meaning the big mirror, the primary mirror, in the light of this star. So the mirror is being illuminated by a single star, and it's so sensitive that you can actually see it. And it's that artifact there that looks so. So if you look in these images around every bright star, JWST has taken a selfie that we have to like realize it's not actually an object. It's just a, a, a ghost. OK, so uh, now you'll notice that in the middle, they're really black. And that's just because that star is too bright for James Webb to make an accurate measurement of its flux in the middle. There's just too much light. It just overloads it. Uh, and these are not bright stars, right? So these stars that I'm showing here are, you know, if I looked at them in a Hubble image, you wouldn't go, oh, that's the brightest star in the picture. It's not. This is just everyday stars, right? So. Uh, 
Fortunately, we're not particularly interested in these very bright stars. They're kind of a nuisance. Uh, we're interested in the really faint stuff. And then whenever we make an image, we always like to like change the color stretch just to make it pop. So we'll have most of the images will look like this. Of course, this images, this light, we're not sensitive to it with our eyes. So there's no real way you know, we can make it whatever color we want. It's not how we perceive it. So just show you what the image looks like uh, coming down from the telescope. You'd say to yourself, well, wh why, why are there only three? Or why are there six or whatever? Like, why are there so many? And, uh, and it seems like an odd number. So I'll describe like how the instrument works. So basically, um, the, the instrument near cam actually takes two pictures at once at two separate places in the sky, right? So it takes, uh, it takes this picture and this picture simultaneously. So this is us, we're, we asked, we actually asked to do this four times. So at one, two, three, and then there would have been more here. The problem is, is we broke the telescope. We broke it. So when, and you can see a hint of why it, that it's doing something weird here that I'll talk about in a little bit. But basically, when we set up these observations, the Canadian instrument needs to find, have some stars that it uses to point the telescope at. And these stars cannot be too bright. Uh, and, uh, well, it turns out there can't be too many of them. So this image over there, that sensor that senses where the telescope points was put more or less on the center of the cluster, and the telescope just didn't know what it was doing because I don't know where I am. There's just too many stars. So it gave up on that one. Uh, and on this one, it did something weird. You can see this looks completely different from over here. Um, on that one, it just it didn't really know where it was pointing very well. So when it added up all the individual images it took, it just made a mistake. And it's something that these data down here we can recover. Uh, but we didn't get everything, and, and then it took about a year before they followed up with the additional ones. So uh, you can see also that it's kind of broken up with these little gaps. And that's because each of these detectors is broken up into smaller ones. So we can zoom in on just this is sort of a typical part of the sky of this image, and you can see even the even the not so bright stars have these spikes on them. And what we're really interested in both cases is objects that are like as bright as this these faint little smudges. These bright stars, they're fine, but we're really interested what we expect. We're looking for very faint failed stars, and we're looking for white dwarfs, which aren't very bright in the infrared. So this is just another place I like, because here, again, we have a selfie. We also have a galaxy there. There are lots and lots of galaxies in the image, but it's just how I've... Um, looked at the contrast, they don't show up very well in the picture. So this is just the same part of the sky as before, but at a wavelength twice as long. So you can see, in fact, you know, nothing particularly weird happened with that instrument um, in the observations. So if we just look, this is just looking at a close up again of with uh, around two microns or two millionths of a meter and uh, around four. And this is the same part of the sky, and you can, it kind of looks a little weird. Uh, like here, I can see this star, but in the other image, that star sits in this gap between the two detectors. And it's kind of fun to flip between these, or you can combine them into um, uh, like a color image to get a sense of, you know, how objects look different. So if you look at this one, 
you know, this is a tiny galaxy. If we zoomed in on it, you would even see that it has some spiral structure. It's very, very far away galaxy. And then if I go to the other, I don't know, sometimes you'll see an object in one image and not the other. And it's, it's just fun to look at. These images are publicly available. If you're ever interested in exploring these data, you just need a web browser. These are just screenshots off a web browser that I'm showing to you right now. So a lot of challenges, right? Because the image is full of stars. And what we basically want to do is measure with some precision the light from very faint objects in these images. So we basically iteratively measure the bright objects and remove them and then look for fainter objects and so on until we can model uh, everything in the image. So this basically is showing what we found. Uh, and it's kind of very preliminary, right? This was actually a, 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 a while ago. Uh, and you can see this is just from a tiny portion of all these images. So it would be from this thing up here, which was the one that just worked well uh, initially. Um, and, and you can see that there's a hint of more objects coming down here. And these are the failed stars that we were looking for. And also, in this region, we're looking for objects like these, which are too bright to be uh, a white dwarf So it, uh, on its own. So it's a white dwarf with some extra material. And basically, like on the one hand, uh, looking at these guys, we see tons of them. In fact, when we look throughout the data, uh, and, and we were expecting a lot, right, if indeed uh, we had these sort of substellar objects in the cluster. For the white dwarfs, where we are looking for the debris around them, it's a lot more challenging because they're relatively few. Uh, and also, they're often nearby another bright star. And so maybe it's the other bright star is affecting their light. So it's a little bit tricky, but, you know, that's the way science goes, right? We have to, we're, we're still trying to figure this all out. So in the second program that, uh, that, uh, that we uh, got uh, time on in the future, so this is not uh, yet taking the data, but it's in the next year. So they call them cycles, but each cycle is about a year. But it gives them the opportunity to make them longer than a year. If they called it year one, year two, then they'd be locked into it. But they call it cycles. Uh, so in cycle three, we are looking again at clusters of stars. This is not a real image of this cluster. This is a cluster of stars. It's a, like, uh, like the one we were talking about before called 47 Takane, except this is towards the center of our galaxy, and it's called Liller 1. Now, Liller 1 is, as I said, it's towards the center of our galaxy, and it's very difficult to see in visible light. If you were to look at Hubble at this, it would be a huge challenge because between us and this cluster, there's lots of dust in the way that absorbs the visible light. So this is just a simulated image of what it would look like with JWST. Uh, the cluster stars are this kind of green color because uh, they are appear brightest from our point of view in the middle part of like around three microns. And that's because at shorter wavelengths, the energy is absorbed on the way. And at longer wavelengths, the stars are faint. So what we're doing uh, to look in this cluster is something a little different, but sort of the same, is the way that James Webb does, it doesn't take a picture really, of course, it takes a movie. So whenever you're observing with James Webb, it measures how much light comes from every part of the image uh, about every 50 seconds or so. So it's with our project, we're actually going to measure how all of these stars in the cluster are flickering, right? How does their light change with time? Now, if we ran out of battery. No, if you're just a regular star, your light kind of doesn't flicker very much. 
And uh, so we're looking for a couple of things. One, and Jamie's here, uh, one is if there's a planet around that star and we'll be looking at maybe 50,000 stars all at once, it might go in front of the star and cause a diminishment in the light. So that's one thing, and that would be cool if we were to find, but there seems to be planets everywhere now. But the nice thing about this is it would be a planet in a, an old population of stars. But also, uh, what we're looking for is this particular object uh, cluster is very, very bright in gamma rays, and we want to understand why. So what we're looking for is uh, stars in orbit around each other so that one star is feeding material onto the other star. So one of the stars is a regular star like the sun or maybe a giant star, and the other star is one of those white dwarfs we talked about. And when that happens, the light flickers. So it's like this picture up top. Uh, you can see that the light is not at a constant level, and it's going up and down here by maybe around 25%. Um, and so what we can measure, this, the, um, the, the dots that are orange are just a simulated James Webb observation of this guy. And for a regular star, you'd be more or less flat. And this flickering that you see is evidence for there being, uh, that there's interaction between the stars. The other thing that happens is, is that the stars just look weird, meaning that their colors aren't right. Uh, so stars sort of run a certain gambit of color because they only really have one variable that you're changing, which is the temperature of the star. So stars basically will follow a sort of path in color land, and, uh, and that's what's shown in the gray here. Uh, whereas stars that have a companion, and, that, and then you have two stars. When you have two stars, they can be different colors, and there can be the material flowing between them, and when you add it all together, you get something that doesn't look like one star. And so that's what we're looking for in these observations. So uh, this is just a picture of Venus going in front of a star. So what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, next is just other JWST things, but I can leave that for questions to bring that up, because perhaps some of you might have questions about other things JWST can do, and I can just go, oh, I prepared a slide for that already. Thank you very much. So I'll leave it open for your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a fascinating talk. Um, so you're open for questions. You said you were. So yes. anybody got any questions? Hello, Jeremy. I um, wonder if you could say something about the lifespan of the telescope itself. Is it up there in space forever, or is it likely to deteriorate, do you think? So uh, basically, you, to stay near this Lagrange point, occasionally you need to use some rockets to keep you in station. So the initial anticipation was that fuel would last about five years because the expectation was on the way you would have to fire the rockets to get into the spot. So it's basically the, the launcher is basically like you're trying to toss a ball up a hill so it just lands right at the top, well balanced. And that's what it achieved. So uh, they didn't end up using much fuel to end up in their final orbit. So I think the expectation is like 20 years worth of fuel to stay there. And then otherwise, it doesn't have expendables other than the fuel. So maybe there are some discoveries. Maybe you can. <laughs> well, I, I'm really just showing things that are you know, things that might come in the future that James Webb can see or, uh, or things to expect. So uh, I showed this picture. I guess it should have come after, uh, but we'll get back to it. So this is just Venus transiting 
uh, the sun. And, and you'll notice on, in this picture, you know, well, there's this funny edge here. And that, that you can actually use when a star transits another star to make measurements about the atmosphere of the planet. So I'll show some pictures of that just to give us an idea of what's uh, going on. And these are just a few different things that, that uh, James Webb is going to help with or is already starting to help with. So this is just a picture of a star in a, a relatively distant galaxy. It's a single star. And you can see here it is in Webb and in Hubble. Well, uh, well, maybe. And what these stars are, they're called Cepheid variables. And if you know how uh, they're variable, so if you know how quickly they vary, that tells you how bright they are inherently. So if you can see them very far away, then you can figure out how far away they are. So James Webb will be uh, looking further out into the universe at these stars, uh, much further than Hubble, because you can just see on the left how much, I mean, it really looks like a star. And on the right, it's like, oh, it's just a fuzz. Uh, so I'll talk, a, that's kind of measuring the size of the universe. Uh, this is just to sh look at uh, particular planets that are orbiting their stars nearby, uh, you know, near to their stars. And one thing that you would imagine, uh, if you think about it a little bit, is like if you think about like the moon going around the Earth, depending on its angle with respect to our star, sometimes it looks like a full moon, sometimes a crescent, sometimes... Uh, half moon. And in fact, when a, a, a planet is orbiting a star, uh, depending on when it's in its orbit, we will see uh, a full planet, a new planet, or half a planet. And this is something that James Webb can see. So this is just a, a, a hot gas giant nearby uh, a relatively near star to Earth. And you can see this up and down here. And that is the phases of that planet as it goes around. And, but also you can look at those phases as a function of wavelength. So as you go to larger wavelength, so you can measure things like where is the hottest part on the planet? Is it hot at noon or is it hot at 11 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon? And you can indeed figure that out on on these, on these surfaces. Here there's another neat thing that you can see that when the planet goes behind the star, you can see the diminishment of the light from the planet. So if you take a spectrum there and you can take the difference between planet behind star and planet just to the side of the star, this would be a full planet and this would be the planet behind. And if you take the difference, you have the spectrum of the planet's emission, which, uh, so here you can see it going behind. So you see what it looks like before it goes behind, and then it's behind, so you're only seeing the star, and then you see the planet reappear on the other side. So you can actually measure the spectrum, or we could call it a spectral energy distribution, because it's not, we don't measure this. Well, here, we're measuring this part, but they aren't, it isn't at very high resolution yet. But we can actually see what is in the planet and maybe infer, in this case, we have different possibilities. On the top would be the planet is really hot, but it's basically rock that's been vaporized. And on the bottom, which fits much better, is that there's gaseous stuff, not just refractory materials on this planet. Um, so here's three planets that are like maybe familiar to us. Like if we were to look at uh, light being absorbed through the atmospheres of on the top is Mars, then Earth, then Venus on the bottom. And this is through the infrared again. Uh, for all three, we see this huge dip due to carbon dioxide uh, because that's common uh, and that dip is, you know, what we're worried about with uh, global warming, in fact. Uh, and on, uh, on Earth 
and but not on Mars, on Venus, we see evidence of water, uh, but we also see evidence of ozone, which means that there's sort of elemental oxygen in the atmosphere, which is very hard to have, or at least we haven't thought of any way, but maybe somewhere without there being something producing the oxygen constantly, because oxygen is very reactive. So it would react with all sorts of things. And on Earth, it's life that produces that oxygen. So one thing that you can imagine doing, uh, you know, in the future with James Webb is if we find a nearby bright star that has an Earth-like planet orbiting it that goes in front of the star, we can actually measure the spectrum, the transmission spectrum of that atmosphere. And, uh, you know, it's part of it is luck, is finding you need a bright star because you want lots of light going through the thin atmosphere of the planet. And, of course, the planet only blocks one part in maybe 10,000 of the star. And the atmosphere only blocks one part in a million of the star. But it's a big telescope. And this is something that we might be able to do, at least for planets a bit bigger than Earth in the not too distant future, is to actually measure, uh, you know, whether there's oxygen in these atmospheres, uh, uh, or here, in fact, ozone is what appears in the infrared. So that, that's my last slide of potential discoveries. Uh, it's more like potential. There, there's been so many actual discoveries, but these are the ones that I th uh, are most exciting to me going forward. Uh, any other questions? Question online from uh, Vijay Verma, um, asking, where was this fabricated and tested? Possibly collaboration of many institutions? Yes, yeah, so uh, it was assembled at the Goddard Space Flight, Space Flight Center in Maryland near, near uh, Washington, D.C. That's where it was finally like all integrated. Different parts of the, the different instruments, like, like I said, the, the nearest and fine guidance sensor were built at the Canadian Space Agency and also the University of Montreal. Uh, NearCam was built at the University of Arizona. Um, the big satellite itself, like what we call the bus, it was built, I believe, by Ball Aerospace. So it's a ton of different organizations contributing uh, different parts of the telescope. I think one of the other spectrographs or other instruments was built by ESA, but I'm not sure which. Of course, ESA launched the mission because uh, the U.S. did not have a large enough rocket in its, uh, in its capability to put uh, such a large satellite at L2. Okay, yeah, Ben. Thank you. Uh, could you tell us, based on the data that your group collected, how many journal papers were you able to publish and what, was, what did they show? Well, we're still figuring it out. So I'm anticipating for the first set of data uh, probably about three or four papers about the uh, one would be about, well, I mean, there have been a bunch of papers doing the theory behind the brown dwarfs that have already been published. And then uh, then we have a papers about our discovery of the brown dwarfs in this cluster, plus the statistics of the white dwarfs, which were not 100% sure because we do see a bunch with excess infrared emission, but we really have to chase down, like, you know, whether they're false positives or not. So, what's and, the significance of those results? Well, th those would tell us that these, let's say they are infrared excess on these white dwarfs, that tells us that that, that star, it's about, been a white dwarf for about 100 million years or so. And during that time, or just before it became a white dwarf, uh, material that was orbiting it, planets and also asteroids, had been funneled towards it to heat up, which means that that object 
had a planetary system and maybe still has a planetary system. So that would be a big deal because the star was born 10 billion years ago, which would mean that you know there were planets around right at the beginning of, uh, of the universe. So it would be a big deal. Uh, yes, any other questions? I'm kind of interested in the in the politics of this. I mean, there are very levels of politics. You know, can you justify spending ten billion on this versus other scientific activities or other human activities? But I want to talk about the data. When you is it publicly available, or when you put in for time, do you get restricted access for, so you don't get scooped by someone else using your? Yes. Yeah, so we get access for one year. But it's basically from one year from when the data was taken. So if like we didn't have a complete picture, so basically we got three quarters of the data like this, and then the fourth quarter came in a year later around when the first three were, uh, were public. So the, these data were sort of taken in September of uh, 2022. So if you look at, you know, these images here, these these are sort of the, like, I think it was around July when they had their announced special images. So basically this was during the, pretty in the shakedown of the telescope, right? And so that delayed our analysis a lot because, well, first of all, we didn't have all the data. Uh, the telescope and part of it it's just the process so also the telescope isn't well calibrated so part one of our results has to do with the calibration of the different parts of the telescope which we can do very precisely so there's a lot of um, you know it's a lot of work uh, getting everything together uh, and and so it's a it's yeah after a year absolutely so the data are available after a year for anybody, for you. It's on the website. You just search for, you know, there's a website where you can go through all the Hubble data, all the James Webb, other telescopes as well. I'm involved in another mission that coincidentally was launched uh, about two weeks before James Webb, um, where it's a much smaller team, like 100-ish people. Their data comes public immediately. So there you really can get scooped if you're not right on top of it. So you don't actually get any lead time whatsoever. Uh, but I mean, that's, I think, a way that uh, you kind of invest a lot of time into understanding what your data is going to be like. And then when the data comes, you can act on it quickly. It just gets exhausting. Uh, but uh, but that's how one has to do it. But James Webb is really complicated, uh, so it just takes a long time to even reduce the data to get even those preliminary uh, catalogs that I showed. Oh, who was James Webb? Yeah. So James Webb was the administrator of NASA during Apollo. So basically, James Webb, when you know Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon, and I guess it's key, and bring him back safely within the decade, it was James <laughs> Webb who made that happen. So uh, you know, uh, and later to a telescope, which is more like the successor of, of Hubble, is called uh, Roman. Uh, and that's named after Nancy Grace Roman who was also a NASA administrator, but also an astronomer. So it's, it's a little bit more palatable. Uh, whereas Webb, it was just at the time because there was this trend of naming the, the big astronomical satellites after, you know, Einstein was one and Hubble and Chandra, which is short for Chandrasekhar. And you can go back and Webb kind of broke that tradition. But given the administrative nightmare of Webb, maybe it was an apt name after all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy.
Um, I think that people here, the number and, uh, well, intensity of questions really illustrates their interest, and um, I think you've uh, explained a lot of things to them. So thank you very much, Jeremy. And as a token of our appreciation, uh -huh. this is the much valued and much sought after uh, Emeritus College umbrella. Excellent. <laughs> I hope I don't have to use it for like six months at least. So.